In this video, we go over how to trace and analyze the time complexity of the bubble sort algorithm. A bubble sort orders an unordered list of items by comparing each item with the next one and swapping the items if they're out of order. The algorithm is finished when no more swaps can be made. In effect, it bubbles the largest or smallest item up to the end of the list. The bubble sort is the most inefficient sorting algorithm, but very easy to implement, so it's a popular choice for very small data sets. It is ideal for situations where a simple, easy to program sorting algorithm is required. It is also worth knowing about purely from an educational and teaching point of view, so you can have an example of a particularly inefficient sorting algorithm time wise. Here is an illustration to help you visualize a bubble sort. We start by initializing a couple of variables with their starting states. n. This variable is used to track how far through the data set we need to check for items to swap on each iteration. We start by setting it to the length of the data set. And swapped. This Boolean value is used to indicate whether a swap has taken place each time we go round the inner for loop. We start by setting it to true, so we'll enter the main while loop at least once to check for unsorted items. We enter a while loop, which will continue to execute while the following two conditions are both met. n is greater than zero and swapped equals true. In other words, this loop will execute until all the items are sorted. Each time around, the while loop assumes there are no items that need to be swapped until we prove otherwise. So we set the swap variable to false. Say the length of the data set returned by items.length is 10. Most arrays or lists are zero index. That means we want to check indexes zero through nine. So we start by setting n to n minus one. Doing this ensures the entire data set will be checked the first time around for items to swap. This value will be decremented by one each time around the outer while loop. The sorted items will gradually bubble up to the end or top of the data set, so there'll be fewer items to check through each time. The program now reaches a nested inner for loop. For each pass through the data set represented by the outer while loop, we need to start at the beginning and work through to the penultimate item of the unsorted data set represented by n minus one. In other words, we need to work through the current subset of items that still need checking. At any point during this inner for loop, if we discover that the item at the current location in the data set, items index, is greater than the next item in the data set, items index plus one, we know it must be out of order. If this is the case, we need to perform two actions. First, we need to swap the two items over. This has been simplified to a single line in the pseudocode here. And secondly, we need to set the swapped variable to true. So when we next check the outer while loop, we know we're still in the process of sorting the data set. We continue through the data set, moving the item up as far as it needs to go until it's in the correct place. This process is repeated as many times as necessary until we discover the entire data set has been sorted. Once again, this is the bare bones of the algorithm. In its current form, it doesn't actually have any data set to sort. It doesn't inform the user whether the data has been sorted successfully and the swap line will need to be fleshed out. We would need to implement all of this using one of our chosen high level programming languages. Here is a syntactically correct Python code that demonstrates the bubble sort algorithm in practice. Here we have added a hard coded list called items, which contains five American states. This initial list is deliberately unsorted. We've also added a line of code that outputs the contents of the data set once it has been sorted. We start by initializing the variables n equals length of items and swapped equals true. So n is five and swapped is true. 
We check if we need to enter the while loop. n is greater than zero is true, swapped equals true is true. As both parts are true, we enter the while loop. We now set swap to false, so swapped equals false, and we decrement n by one, n equals n minus one. We enter the inner nested for loop for index in range naught to n. So taking the current value of n, this reads in range naught to four. In Python, this means values zero to four, not including four itself. Effectively, this means the for loop is going to execute four times. We now compare the item at items index with the item at items index plus one. We're essentially asking the question, is the value held in items index greater than the value held in items index plus one? Well, items index is zero and that's Florida. Items index plus one, zero plus one is Georgia. Is Florida greater than Georgia? Well, that's false. These items do not need swapping. They're already in order. The for loop increments its internal index value from 0 to 1 and we enter the for loop again. Once again, we compare items index and items index plus 1. So that's Georgia and Delaware. Georgia is greater than Delaware. These items are in the wrong order and will need to be swapped. So we enter the if statement. The actual swap is performed as a three-stage process in Python. We copy the value currently held in items index Georgia out to a temporary variable. We can now re replace the value of items index with the value of the item currently in items index plus one, Delaware. And now we can take the value stored in the temporary variable Georgia and copy it over to items index plus one. We've effectively now swapped the two items over. Now, before we exit the if statement, we set our Boolean variable swap to true so that we can indicate that a swap has taken place. The for loop increments its internal index value from one to two and we enter the for loop again. So we're doing the same thing, comparing index to index plus one. So that's Georgia to Alabama. If Georgia is greater than Alabama is true. So these items were in the wrong order will need to perform a swap, so we enter the if statement. We follow the same three stage swap as before, but this time we're swapping the contents at items 2, Georgia, with items 2 plus 1, Alabama. We also set swap to true again. Now technically speaking, this doesn't have any effect, it's already true following the previous swap, but it still happens. The for loop increments from 2 to 3, and we enter the for loop again. We're comparing items index with items index plus one. So that's Georgia with California. If Georgia is greater than California, well, that's true. The items are in the wrong order, so they need to be swapped. We enter the if statement again. We follow the same three stage swap, and this time we're swapping Georgia with California. Again, swap is set to true, which has no effect as it's already true. Georgia has successfully bubbled up to the end of the list and is now in the correct location. The for loop increments index from three to four, and we discover we're now outside the required range. We are done executing the inner for loop for now, and we fall back to the outer while loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop once more. n is greater than zero. Well, that's still true because n is four. Swapped equals true. Well, it is. We made a swap at least once during our last trip through the while loop. Both parts are true we enter the outer while loop again. We now set swap to false once more. Remember, each time around the while loop, we assume there's nothing that needs to be swapped until we prove otherwise. And don't forget, we decrement n by one, so that's now three. We do this for efficiency. When we hit the inner for loop, we don't need to check the whole data set, as we know the items shown in green are already in their correct place. We enter our inner nested for loop, for index in range 0 to n. So taking the current value of n, this reads as 0 to 3. Now remember, in Python, this means value 0 to 3, not including 3 itself. Effectively, this means the for loop will execute three times. Now that you should be getting the hang of this algorithm, we'll streamline our explanations a little bit. Once again, we ask if the value in items index is greater than index plus 1. Well, Florida is greater than Delaware is true. These items are in the wrong order. 
they need to be swapped. We enter the if statement. We swap Florida and Delaware over using the temporary swap variable. And we set the Boolean variable swap to true to indicate a swap has taken place. The for loop increments its internal index from 0 to 1 and we enter the for loop again. Again, we ask, is items index greater than items index plus 1? Is Florida greater than Alabama? It is. They need swapping. We enter the if statement. We perform the three-stage swap using our temp variable. The for loop increments its internal index from 1 to 2 and we enter the for loop again. We ask, is items index greater than the value of items index plus 1? So is Florida greater than California? Well, it is. That's true. They're in the wrong order. They need swapping. We enter the if statement. We perform our three-stage swap. Florida has successfully bubbled up to the end of the list and is now in the correct location. The for loop increments its internal index value from 2 to 3 and we'll discover we're now outside the required range. We're done with executing this inner for loop for now and fall back to our outer while loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop once more. N is greater than zero is still true. Swapped equals true is true, as we made a swap at least once during our last trip through the while loop. Both parts are true, so we enter the while loop once more. As before, we start the while loop by setting swap back to false, and we decrement N by one. And remember, we're doing this for efficiency. When we hit the inner for loop, we don't need to check the whole data set. As we know, the items shown in green, and there's two of those now, are already in their correct place. We enter the inner nested for loop. And this time, we take the current values of n, which reads from range 0 to 2. So this means we're going to go through the inner for loop twice. You should be pretty comfortable with this algorithm. So Delaware and Alabama are in the wrong order. So we enter the if statement and we swap them. Remember, we also set swapped to true to indicate a swap has occurred. The for loop increments from 0 to 1 and we enter the for loop again. Delaware and California are in the wrong order, so we enter the if statement and swap them again. Delaware has successfully bubbled up to the end of the list and is now in the correct location. The for loop increments its internal index from 1 to 2 and discovers we're outside the required range. We are once again done with executing the inner for loop and fall back to the outer while loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop once more. n is greater than 0 is still true. Swapped equals true is true as we made a swap at least once during our last trip through the while loop. Both parts are true. We enter the outer while loop again. As before, we start the while loop by setting swapped back to false and decrementing n by 1. We've hit the inner for loop, and this time it's range 0 to 1. So effectively, we're going to go around this inner for loop once. The items we're comparing, Alabama and California, we discover they're in the correct order, so we can skip the code inside the if statement. The for loop increments its internal index from 0 to 1. We discover we're now outside of the required range. We're done executing the inner for loop already and fall back to the while loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop once more. n is greater than 0 is still true. Swapped equals true is now false, as no swaps were made during our latest trip through the while loop. The while loop requires both conditions to be true, so we're now done with the outer while loop, and the data set is sorted. The algorithm is complete, and we finish off by printing out the contents of the sorted items list to the user. So what is the efficiency of a bubble sort? Well, in the best case, the data set is already sorted, in which case only one pass is required to check all the items in the list and no swaps will be made. So it's of a linear complexity, ON. Now, this is not usually the case, as the purpose of the algorithm is to sort a data set. As the algorithm contains a nested loop, it has a polynomial time complexity, or ON to the power of 2 because the time it takes to execute both iterations increases with the size of the data set. However, it does not require any additional memory, making it what we call an in-place sorting algorithm. 
it can be performed on the data structure containing the data set. So the space complexity is O1 or constant. It doesn't change. Let's consider a couple of final thoughts on the bubble sort algorithm. As our previous video, what we've presented you here is not the single correct version of a bubble sort. No such thing exists. It's simply our implementation. You will see slightly different variations of this in textbooks, past papers and other videos. So let's consider a few possible alterations to the original pseudocode that we presented here. In this version, we've replaced the outer while loop with a for loop. We've also removed any reference to the setting, updating or tracking of a swapped variable. This is much less efficient than our previous version, as it will perform the maximum number of passes through the data set and check all the items, regardless of how sorted the data already is. However, it's still a bubble sort algorithm. In our pseudocode, we assume the data set is implemented using a zero indexed array or list. However, you may be programming a language that supports a data set or structure that doesn't start at zero index for the first element and instead starts at one. There have been attempts to improve the efficiency of the bubble sort, including reversing the direction of the algorithm after each iteration. This variation is known as a cocktail sort. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. Can you successfully implement a bubble sort using a high level programming language of your choice? And do you understand how a bubble sort works? And can you trace its code to explain how it works? Dave and I know that data structures and algorithms are one of the hardest areas of the course. And we've therefore written a dedicated book, which is available to purchase on Amazon. The book covers all the data structures and algorithms you need to be aware of for the exam. Each one has its own dedicated chapter. The chapter overviews the data structure or algorithm, gives you applications, operations, links to our videos online, and goes over the algorithm in simple structured English, a visualization, pseudocode, and is fully coded in Python, C Sharp, and Visual Basic. Thank you.